10-part series on the Holy Spirit. Message number one, Encounter with the Holy Spirit. For more information, visit www.spiritofthelord.com. An encounter with the Holy Spirit. I believe one of the most important steps towards a deeper relationship with God is for us to have a personal encounter with the Spirit of God. I'm not talking about simply receiving Jesus by faith or learning about God through the scriptures or learning a teaching or about the Holy Spirit or simply hearing about Him or reading a book about Him. But for you to personally experience God in a deep and personal way. And that's available for each one of, the, of God's children. You don't have to wait till you go to heaven for you to experience the glory of God. And you know, it's very important to understand this. God, the Bible says that we shall live by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And our walk should always be based on faith. But that, that, that does not mean that God does not want you to experience His emotions and His glory and His love and His joy and His peace. He wants you to experience all that He is. And that happens when you encounter the Holy Spirit. And if you read through the Scriptures, one of the things that's really going to uh, impact your life is that every man or every woman that was ever used by God at one point in their life they were anointed with the Holy Spirit every single one of them at one point in their life their secret was that the Holy Spirit had filled them even through history and even today the men and women that are being used by God today at one point in their life they encounter in a personal way the Spirit of God and most of the times we give too much credit to people and to men. We give too much glory to men. Oh, look what he did or look at what she's doing. And when we don't realize is that it's the Spirit of God in them, giving them the ability to accomplish all those awesome works for the Lord. I believe with all of my heart that the Holy Spirit wants to influence every one of these gates. He wants to influence the media, the arts, the, the family, the market, the government. It's the Holy Spirit in people, working through people that surrender their will to the will of God. Is what's going to lead us to influence the city, influence your family, influence your job, influence the place where you are, your, every place that you go. If you surrender to the Holy Spirit, He will use you to win people to Jesus and give you wisdom to influence all these areas let's go to the first uh, scripture for tonight it's in first Samuel chapter 16 and this is one of my favorite stories well I have a lot of favorite stories in the Bible but this is one of them let's start <laughs> my wife tells me that all the time you always say that's your favorite story every single story you read first Samuel chapter 16 verse 6 we're speaking about having an encounter with the Holy Spirit so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said surely the Lord's anointed is before him but the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abdinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him in, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. 
in the old testament the lord would only anoint or give his spirit to prophets priests and kings only very specific people he would anoint with his presence of the holy spirit he would pour out his presence upon very specific people and the bible tells us that god chose this man named saul to be king over israel and he anointed him with the spirit but he disobeyed the lord he turned his back on the lord and he refused to turn to return to the lord when he was confronted with his sin and the bible says that that the spirit of god departed from saul and that an evil spirit was tormenting him and god said i'm gonna choose a new king i'm gonna choose a king that has a heart after my own heart I'm going to choose a different person to take the place of Saul. So he sent this prophet named Samuel to the house of Jesse. And when Jesse walked in the house, the first person that he saw was the oldest brother. Tall, handsome, good looking, strong. And he, his heart, Samuel said, wow, this is the one. This is the next king of Israel. This is the next person that God is going to use to lead his people. And the Lord spoke some profound words to his heart. And he said, don't look at his outer appearance. Men look and judge at, because of their outer appearance. But God does not look at your outer appearance. God looks at the heart. And that goes against many things that, and perceptions that we have in life. Especially in this culture, many times people are judged because of their outer appearance. Because of the color of the skin because you're short because you're tall people place you in categories because the way you dress because the way you comb your hair because of the clothes you wear and especially even younger people their self-esteem many times is determined by their outer appearance because everywhere you look is magazines movie everything that people supposedly to be worth something in society usually the ones that are uh, good looking on the outside they are strong they have a, a, a appearance that they have something something important about them and people judge us because of the outer appearance even in school you're gonna be judged because of your brains not because of your heart if you're smart, if you make good grace, then you're going to, oh, you're good. You're going to go ahead and good, good things in life. You get a scholarship. You get to go to the best university. Same thing in work. You're judged because of your performance. And many times we think that God is going to judge us because of our performance, before, because of our knowledge, because of our social status, or even because of the way we are. But God does not look at any of those things. God tonight is looking at your heart he sees what nobody else sees he sees your heart he sees your pain he sees your emptiness he knows your dreams he knows your deceptions he knows your mistakes he knows everything that goes inside your heart that only you know and I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna shock you some of you God not only sees your heart but God loves your heart God loves your heart God does not reject your heart God loves your heart see when when the Lord spoke these words to me that God loved my heart he shocked me because all of my life I have believed that God was mad at me that God was disappointed with me that I that God was angry with me but when I saw that he was completely the opposite that God was in love with me it changed my whole perception of how I saw God and how I approached God for the rest of my life. And tonight, God wants your perception of God to be changed. For you not to believe that God is disappointed with you. God is angry with you. God loves your heart. God loves who you are. And the Bible says that when Samuel went and they said they went through seven brothers and none of them were chosen. So do you have anyone? Yeah, the little one. He's out in the field, but nobody pays attention to him. He's the smallest one. We... we He's the one who takes care of the sheep. Oh, but when David was out by himself taking care of the sheep, well, nobody else was looking. God was looking at him. The same way, you know when God really looks at you? When you're by yourself. When nobody else is looking. That's when God places his eyes on you and God starts examining your heart. And God starts testing your heart. And God starts seeing what your heart is really made out of. And that's when God saw David. You know what David was doing? He was writing psalms to the Lord. He was worshiping the Lord. He was seeking the Lord. All out there in the middle of the field. And God saw him. And God went and he 
got him. He brought him in. And they said, we're not going to stand until he comes. And when he came in, the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, Arise, anoint him, for he is the one. And Samuel grabbed oil and poured it on his head. And as that oil started being poured upon his head, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon David with power from that day forward. And it was the Holy Spirit, the one who led him to influence government, let's put it that way, in that kingdom. Is the Holy Spirit the one who gave him wisdom to lead the people of God? Is the Holy Spirit the one who gave him wisdom to write, to write the Psalms? Is the Holy Spirit the one who led him, to give him the strength to defeat giants? Many times we put uh, David in a pedestal, but it was the Holy Spirit, it wasn't David. Working through, it was the Holy Spirit working through David. And when David, because he wasn't perfect, fell into sin, the Bible says that he, uh, this prophet named Nathaniel went and confronted him. And when he recognized his sin, you know what he did? He returned quickly to the Lord and said, God, purify me. Lord, Lord, cleanse me, creating me a pure heart. Do not. And he said, take whatever you want from me. You can take my kingdom. You can take my possessions. You can take my money. You can take even my family. You can take my health. But he said, but never take your Holy Spirit from me. The most important possession that David had, and he knew it, it was the Holy Spirit. He was the one, the thing that he held most precious to his life because he knew it was the Holy Spirit, the one who led him to do everything that he did. The Bible also tells us the story of, of Joshua. He was used mightily by the Lord to conquer the promised land, to lead the people of God into the promised land. And we hear these great stories of how God used Joshua to do mighty works for him. But at one point in his life, he was just the servant of Moses. And in Exodus 33, 11, he tells us that Moses will speak to the Lord in the tabernacle face to face. But when he was finished speaking, he will go home. But Joshua, the son of Nun, stayed in the tabernacle. Isn't that amazing? If Joshua would have been at this service tonight, whenever the service is over and we all go home, he would be hiding under those chairs, lying right there at the altar. Because he loved to be near the presence of God. He loved to listen to God as he talked to Moses. And you know what? It seemed to me that the Lord also started enjoying the presence of Joshua. Because when Moses was about to die, he, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Go and lay your hands on Joshua. And the Bible says that when Moses laid his hands on Joshua, Deuteronomy 34, 9, that the spirit of wisdom came upon Joshua. Elijah, he was simply... Uh, plowing along in a field but the Lord was looking at his heart also and he told Elijah go and anoint him in your place and I think that Elijah didn't like that very much because he simply walked by he didn't say nothing he just threw his mantle on him and walked away he, he didn't even tell him you know the Lord called me to anoint you no no he just threw the mantle and just walked away and when Elijah felt the anointing of God he felt the power of God he Immediately killed all those oxen, killed all that, gave it to the, the people who were there to eat. And he, by killing that, he was saying, I'm leaving everything behind. I'm letting go of everything. And I'm following that man wherever he goes. And for seven years, he became a servant of Elijah. And Elijah, uh, time and time again, would tell him, get away from me. I don't want you to follow me. I don't want you to be with him. But I said, I am not going to let you go. And when Elijah asked him, what is it that you want from me? He knew exactly what he wanted. He didn't hesitate. He had to think about it. He had been thinking about it for the past seven years. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. He didn't ask. I don't say, I don't want, I want the title of prophet. Oh, I want your house or I want your possessions or I want your ministry. No, no, no. He said, I want a double portion of the spirit that's upon you. And Elijah said, you have asked a hard thing. He said, if you see me taking up to heaven, then you're going to receive it. And then he saw him and he received the double portion. And double the amount of great and mighty miracles done under his ministry were done, uh, were done over Elisha and Elijah. To the point that even his bones, when he died, his bones were so impregnated with the anointing of God, with the power of God, that they threw a dead person upon those dead bones. He, they, he was immediately risen back and up to life. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, we have Paul. He persecuted the church. He had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He fell off his horse. But before he started his ministry, the Lord blinded him for three days. And then a man named Ananias came to him and laid his hands on him and said, The Lord Jesus has sent me for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and for you to receive your sight. 
Later on, Paul wrote, and hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out on our hearts through the Holy Spirit. See, Paul did not just know intellectually that God had demonstrated his love on the cross by giving his life for him. He also had experienced the love of God being poured upon his heart. We have the example of Peter. He denied Jesus three times. He was a wimp. You know, he, haven't, he denied him three times. How many times have we denied him? But after he experienced the Holy Spirit in the upper room, after he encountered the Holy Spirit, he arose and he preached the gospel and 3,000 were saved. And even his shadow as he walked healed the sick. But it wasn't his shadow. It wasn't Peter. It was the Spirit of the Lord that was upon Peter doing the miracles. The amazing thing is that many people think that that stopped at the time of the Bible. There's many believers that think, oh, that was for back then. That was for them to experience. That's for them to live. But I have good news for you. That Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the same Spirit is still moving upon the earth. He hasn't stopped. You know, when I started preparing this message, I got to confess something. I'm a, I'm a compulsive book buyer. Not a reader, buyer. <laughs> I see books and I buy them. So I buy them and I think I'm going to read them, but I never do. So I have a whole library full of books on the Holy Spirit, of men and women have been used by God. Everything that has to do with the revival, the Holy Spirit, miracles, the power of God, everything that has to do with the supernatural move of God, everything that, that I, that's what, that's my hobby. <laughs> so it's dangerous for me to go to Amazon.com. And, and my wife gets really upset with me. So why do you, because they keep coming in the mail. <laughs> so why do you spend all this money on these books? You know, I'm going to read them sometime. But I started doing some research on the, on the, through history, the men and women that have been used by God. I started looking at their lives and seeing if they had encountered the Holy Spirit in their lives. And it's amazing. But every single one of them did. I'm going to sh share just a few quotes. Some of them are really nice. Um, the first one is in the 17th century. A young lady named Madame Jean Guyon is one of my favorite persons in history. She had a, one of the deepest intimacies with Christ. And she, her, she had a prayer life that was amazing. And she was incarcerated. She was put in dungeons for it. But she continued to write. And her writing inspired many. In a time where the church was covered by darkness, she inspired many to, to close her relationship with Christ. When she was 20 years old, a young monk, Franciscan monk, came to her and, and shared with her about salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is what she wrote. I experienced those words in the canticles. Your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Songs of Solomon 1.3 For I felt in my soul an anointing that healed all my wounds in a moment. I did not sleep at all that night because your love, O oh God, flowed in me like delicious oil and burned as a fire that was going to destroy all that was left of self in an instant. I was suddenly so altered that I and others could hardly recognize myself. And she also wrote about that encounter. I felt that this instant deeply wounded with the love of God, a wound so delightful that I desired it never may be healed. That's awesome. That's what the Lord does. See, the Lord wounds you with His love. Religion tries to force you to do things. God draws you with His love and you just cannot refuse Him because you fall in love with Him. So my, our prayer should be, God wound us with His love. John Wesley, January 1st, 1739, he was used to start the Methodist Church. If you read history, every denomination today at one point was started by a great move of the Holy Spirit, even the Assemblies of God. They all started by a move of the Holy Spirit. John Wesley says, it was about three in the morning, he wrote, as you were continuing steadfastly in prayer, a power of God came mightily upon us, in so much that many cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. As soon as we recovered a little from the awe and amazement at the presence of His Majesty, we broke out with the one voice we praise you O God we acknowledge you to be Lord and the Lord used them mightily to bring revival to that whole area of the world in England at one time he wrote one of his meetings some sunk down and 
there remained no strength in them, and others exceedingly trembled and quaked. Some were torn with a kind of convulsive motion in every part of their bodies as the Holy Spirit moved in His services. Catherine Kuhlman, you all heard about her. The Lord used her mightily in the 70s to, to bring many to the Lord and to reveal the Holy Spirit to many people. Well, when she was only 14 years old, she wrote, she was in a, in a Methodist church, and she wrote that, this is what she wrote, I was standing beside Mama, her mom, and the hands of the church clock were pointed to five minutes before 12 o'clock. She remembered exactly the time. I can't remember the minister's name or even one word of his sermon. I hope that happens to you tonight. But this happened to me. As I stood there, I began shaking to the extent that I could no longer hold the hymnal. So I laid it on the pew and sobbed. I was feeling the weight of conviction and I realized that I was a sinner. I did the only thing that I needed to do. I slipped out from where I was standing and walked to the front pew and sat down in the corner of the pew and wept. Oh, how I wept. Charles Finney used to bring revival to, to the whole parts of the United States and England also in the 17th and 18th century. This is what he wrote. The Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through me body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love. I wept aloud with joy and love and literally bellowed out of an audible gushings in my heart. The waves came over and over me, one after the other, until I recall I cry out, I will die if these waves continue to pass over me. I said, Lord, I cannot bear it anymore. Yet I had no fear of death. That's an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And out of all the ones I read, this is my favorite one. His name is Evan Roberts. He was used in the Wells Revival, one of the greatest revivals they ever gone through humanity. It was so powerful, this revival, that it was, uh, there were many coal mines and they would train the mules the, the workers were training the mules by using cuss words to turn, to go forward. And when the revival hit, the lives were so transformed that they had to retrain the mules because they wouldn't obey the commands anymore. Isn't that awesome? Imagine going down 6th Street and, and no more cussing, no more, no more nothing, no more clubs, nothing. Just everybody worshiping the Lord. That would be awesome to see. September 29, 1904, after 13 years of seeking the Lord for a deeper experience with the Holy Spirit, this is what he wrote. He was in an evangelistic meeting. When others prayed, I felt a living force come into my bosom. It held my breath and my legs shivered. The living force grew and grew and I was almost bursting. My bosom was boiling. What, boiling, what boiled me was the verse, God commending His love. I fell on my knees and with my arms over the seat in front of me and tears and perspiration flowed freely. I thought blood was gushing forth. For about two minutes, it was fearful. I cried, bend me, bend me, bend us. After I was bent, a wave of peace came over me and I thought of the bending of the judgment day and I was filled with compassion for those who will be bent on that day and I wept. Henceforth, the salvations of souls became the burden of my heart. From that time, I was on fire with a desire to go through all whales. And if it were possible, I was willing to pay God for allowing me to go. How many of you would be willing to pay God for allowing you to go? You know, when people say, I have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and if you don't have passion for the lost, I don't believe you really had it. An encounter with the Holy Spirit. When when you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, the first one of the first things going to happen, the Lord's going to break your heart for the lost. You're going to have compassion for the people who don't know Him, and that's going to drive you to the point that say, God, I'm willing to pay for you to lead me to go. You know, many countries that we go to, they don't. We pay our own tickets. They don't give us offering many times. We just go. I don't go. I travel 20 hours driving airplanes, waiting in airports, driving in cars. You know, them going through mountains in Eastern Europe, being far away from your family, eating all kinds of things, you know. But you know what? But well, because you had an encounter with God that's changed your life so much that He made He made God real to you. And He made the reality of eternity real to you. And the reality of the importance of what really matters in life is the things that are internal. And the, and, and the, and the people really have to make one decision that's going to determine their eternities, where to believe in Christ or to reject Him. That's going to determine the rest of eternity. And it's up to us to go and tell them. And the Holy Spirit will touch your heart. Reinhard Bonnke, today, the same thing keeps happening. When he was 13 years old, he was at a prayer meeting. This is what he wrote. Suddenly, all heaven seemed to crowd into my small frame. 
the strength of God poured over me and into me inside. An expressible joy filled my heart. And I began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave me utterance. He's been used today to bring millions of people, literally millions of people to Christ in Africa. He's seen one million people saved in one day under his ministry. But look, it was the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit working through him. David Yonggi Cho has got the largest church in the world and it's an assembly of God church also by the way one night while I was asking the Lord for the infilling of the Holy Spirit I felt his presence draw near it was a marvelous experience while I was worshiping I felt the warm heat touch my face my tongue my body and without realizing it I started to say new words that were coming to my mind and to my tongue and at the same time my heart was overflowing with praise and adoration towards Jesus in a new tongue I was overfilled with joy and a new consciousness of a new power with God that I had never known before he also wrote if I had to to evaluate what I have learned since my conversion, I would say that to find the Holy Spirit and learn to know Him in, intimate, in an intimately way has been the greatest experience of my life. I could go on and on all night sharing testimonies of people that have encountered the Holy Spirit. The amazing thing is that the Holy Spirit wants you to have an encounter with Him. He desires for each one of us to experience who He is, to experience His person, to, to get a glimpse if you could only get a glimpse of His beauty, if you could just hear just the whisper of His Word, if you could just simply experience and feel the depths of His love for you, if you could just simply taste His goodness and see that His loving kindness is better than life, you'd be willing to just let go of everything just to obey Him. See, God would not force you. God makes you fall in love with Him. And when you fall in love with Him, but when you have that experience and you know Him personally and intimately, it's, 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 you completely fall in love with it. The way I could describe it, what happened with me was love at first sight. And many people don't believe in love at first sight. Well, I do. That's what happened with my wife also. I saw her. The moment I saw her, I said, she's going to be mine. Because I had never seen so much beauty and so much passion for Jesus combined. <laughs> so I said, she's going to be mine. And that same day, I told a friend of mine, I'm going to marry her. And that same year, I married her at the same altar that I met her. <laughs> and we've been married for two years now. And we're expecting a baby and, and we're serving the Lord together. But I believe in that, you know. I don't know. I do. Some people don't. I do. <laughs> and with the Holy Spirit, it was the same way. When I saw Him. When I felt Him, when I saw what He did, when I saw what He stood for, when I saw how He glorified Christ, when I saw how He healed the sick, when I saw how He touched the deepest parts of people's emotions and hearts, when I saw how He healed the wounded, when I saw how He transformed cities, I said, I was in love. He had me. He had me. And I knew I belonged to Him for the rest of my life. And that encounter with God that I had in Argentina, well, I spent two hours under the fire of God. I fell to the floor and I, and when God spoke to me, if that was the only encounter I ever had, it would be enough for me to serve him the rest of my life. Even if I never felt one more chill the rest of my life. You can have more encounters. I mean, you can have, you can live from encounter to encounter. And that's what I, I love to do. You just keep encountering him every day, you know, every, every chance that you get. But just one encounter to me is enough for you to fall in love with Jesus for the rest of your life. What did Jesus said? How do we encounter the Holy Spirit? If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the first thing that we need to realize is that the Holy Spirit is not only beautiful, it's not only powerful, it's not only good, it's not only loving, he's also holy. That's why he's called the Holy Spirit. His main attribute, I believe, is holiness. And there's something that separates you and me from a holy God. It's not uh, your age. It's not your social status that separates you from God. It's not the color of your skin that separates you from God. It's not where you're born will separate you from God. It's not what denomination you belong or what religion you belong to will separate you from God when it comes to the end or here on earth. What separates us from God is one thing alone. That is our sin. And the Bible says that we have all sinned. Every single one of us, including me, including the pastor, including every man in this world, has have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does it mean? We have all broken the law of God and 
because of that we're separated from the presence of God not only here on earth but for eternity all of us at one point you have lied you have cheated maybe maybe you have taken the Lord's name in vain maybe you have stolen maybe you have lusted upon looked upon a woman and lusted maybe you've been drunk sometime we have all at one point of our life even if it's a little thing we have broken the law and we all separated from God and this is the most serious thing we could talk about we're separated from God not only here on earth but for eternity the Lord's been burning in my heart the reality of heaven and hell they're real places the, if you believe the Bible, you need to believe in the heaven and the hell. And I don't want to scare you, you know, that's not my point in saying this. But I just want to say that you're going to live for eternity. This life does not end when you die. You're going to live for eternity. And there's something that's separating you and it's separating me from God. And that should bring fear to our hearts. And that is our sin. And we have all sin. But the amazing thing about this and the amazing thing the greatest news that you could hear in your life is that this God that looks at your heart and he sees your sin in your heart and loves your heart so much that was willing to die on a cross and shed his blood and die on the cross so that you and I could receive the forgiveness for our sins he was taking your place and in my place on the cross. People say, why is Jesus the only way to heaven? Because he is the only person in history that took your place in my place on the cross. Nobody else did that. There's been people who started all kinds of different religions and all different kinds of theologies and all different kinds of ideologies. But there's only one man that took upon himself what separated you and me from God and his name is Jesus. That's why whenever you receive Jesus, whenever you believe in His name, whenever you receive Him into your heart, and whenever you make a decision to turn from your sins and return to God with all of your heart, something supernatural happens. Is that the Spirit of God comes in you. He seals you. And the Spirit of God comes and gives testimony to your spirit that you are a son and that you are a daughter of God. How do you know you're saved? It's because the Spirit gives testimony to your spirit. You don't have a diploma, you don't have a degree. It's the Holy Spirit, the one who gives testimony to your spirit. If you have doubts about your salvation, then you're not saved. If you don't know if you're going to heaven or hell tonight, then you need to leave this place filled with the Holy Spirit with an assurance that God has you in His hand and that nothing and no one will be able to separate you from the love of God. How do you do that? You simply place your trust and your faith on the work of Jesus on the cross and you make a decision to turn away from your sin and when you do that the Holy Spirit will come and abide in you he, you will be filled you, he will come and seal your heart but that's not all that's not all God has more God wants to fill you with his spirit God wants you to encounter his presence God wants you to behold his beauty and that happens when you encounter the Holy Spirit there's not there's not really a formula how to encounter the Holy Spirit if you read the stories if you read even in the scriptures every case is different I mean it's not something that you do one two three and boom you have it it's not something like you pray a prayer and boom you encounter him some people I have read stories that for example, Charles Finney, the same day that he got saved, he got filled with the Holy Spirit. There's people who for years seek him and they never find him. And it's harder for other people to find him. Some people you pray and then boom, the Lord encounters them. Some people, you, it's different. I don't know. But we can take some advice, I would say, some instruction from what Jesus said. If you can listen to anybody, listen to Jesus. This is what he said. Ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find knock and the door will be open to you he says how many of you how many of you fathers if your son ask you or your daughter ask you for a piece of bread would you would you give him a stone and how many of you fathers if your son ask you for a fish would you give him a snake or a serpent and how many of you, if, God, if your son or your daughter ask you for an egg, you will give him a scorpion? And then he goes on to say, if you being bad know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more would your Father who's in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? 
ask. Most Christians never think about it. But you need to ask God. God will never force it on you. You need to ask Him. God, I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I ask you to anoint me with the Holy Spirit. I ask you to encounter me with the Holy Spirit. I open my heart and I ask you. I desire you. Number one. Number two, it says, seek and you shall find. You got to seek Him with all of your heart. You seek Him. The Bible says this. You seek Him with your heart. You seek Him with your spirit. And you seek Him with your even with your flesh david said early will i seek you my soul thirsts for you my flesh longs for you he was seeking him with his soul his emotions thirsting even his flesh was longing for him i say i said with my soul i have desired you in the night yes by my spirit within me i will seek you early i said 26 9 you seek him with your spirit because he's a spirit you seek him with your spirit you long for him with your with your soul you desire him with your flesh everything within you should desire him God early in the morning late at night should be a desire a seeking in your heart and number three he says knock and the door will be open to you and the Lord showed me this he said for salvation he told me I knock at the door of your heart but to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to knock at the door of my heart. See the difference? For salvation is Jesus, the one who draws you. Jesus is the one who convinces you. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals Christ to your heart. The Holy Spirit is the one who's looking after you. He's the one who's desiring you. But once you're saved, He leaves you alone. And He says, now if you want more, you have to come and knock at the door of my heart for more. And if you knock at the door of God's heart, I promise you, He will open the door of His heart and He will let you in. Jesus stood in the temple, stood on the last day of the feast. It's another one. After everybody had tried everything, imagine you're going to 6th Street probably like around 4 o'clock in the morning tonight after everybody's been drunk, dance, had everything, kind of drug and everything. And Jesus standing up in 6th Street and saying, if any one of you, thirsts if any one of you here thirsts let him come to me and he said and he who believes come to me and drink and he who believes like the scripture said out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water he said Jesus was saying you know that alcohol is not going to satisfy you that drugs is not going to satisfy you Sex is not going to satisfy you. Pornography is not going to satisfy you. It's gonna, you're going to go home after this party and you're going to be more empty than when you come in. But if you're really thirsty, number one, you need to be thirsty. See, most people, most a lot of Christians are not thirsty. That's why you never encounter the Holy Spirit. If you're not thirsty, you don't expect to encounter Him. You need to be desperate. That's why sometimes, you know what, I feel like people who are just saved have greater encounters with God than people that have been in the church for many years. Because people who have been in the church for many years, they lose their thirst. But people who are baby Christians, they come thirsty, expecting, and they receive from God. You come, you gotta come to Him thirsty. Number two, you gotta go to Jesus. Come to me, said Jesus. No man, no preacher, no evangelist, no prophet, no pastor can fill you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who pours out His Spirit upon your life. If you want to encounter the Holy Spirit, you go to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I am thirsty. And He says, then you need to drink. What does that mean? You need to open your heart and allow Him to lavish His presence and His love upon your life. And as you drink, He says, and if you believe, Number four, you need to believe. If you believe out of your innermost being, out of your spirit will flow rivers of living water. Do you know that you have a fountain inside of you? You have a fountain in, in, in you. It's in you. It's not out of you. Most people see the spirit is like this. Then the soul covers the spirit and then the body covers the soul. The soul is where you make your decisions. And most in the soul is what thirsts and what longs. And most people look outward to satisfy that thirst. Most people look outward for entertainment, for money, for, for fun, 
Most people are looking outward to experience things. They're looking outwards to feel love. They're looking outwards to feel emotions. They're looking outwards to feel joy. They're looking outward to get satisfaction. When Jesus is saying, out of your innermost being will flow. If you really want to drink and if you really want to find satisfaction, you got to draw your soul inwards towards your spirit. And in your spirit is where you find that fountain of living water. And out of you, that spirit, out of your, out of, out of the spirit in your, out of the Holy Spirit in your spirit is where you drink out of His presence. You don't have to go looking for there or over there, or over there, for the kingdom of God is within you. Behold, I tell you a mystery: is Christ in us? the hope of glory you are the temple of the Holy Spirit it's out of your spirit where you can drink living water spring forth living water so if you want to be satisfied stop looking outwards and start looking into your spirit and start seeking the Lord with your spirit and you know God's gonna give you to drink out of the living water if you only knew that's all I have to say. If you only knew how beautiful he is. If you only knew how good he is. If you only knew how holy he is. If you only knew the depths of his love for you. If you only knew the dreams that he has for your life. The plans that he has for your life. If you only knew.